There's a lot going on in that sequence. Let's stop, break it down, and go through it again. No matter whether you're a novice, an experienced technical diver, or a diving professional, there are a number of key elements that you must take into consideration when you're planning to dive safely. Good buoyancy control is critical and it's an essential skill that divers must master. This skill should be practiced on all dives. Divers must have a thorough understanding of the physics and physiology involved in diving and the effects of pressure changes on their bodies. Divers need to be able to recognize decompression illness and barotrauma by learning the signs and symptoms to look out for. The casualty is often the last person to recognize that they are affected. So keep a close watch on your buddy and other members of the group. Most importantly of all, if you think you have a problem, tell someone. Self-denial occurs in many cases for many different reasons, but delay to treatment is the result. Remember, any person who has been exposed to increased barometric pressure is at risk, and any unusual signs or symptoms exhibited after diving must be treated as decompression illness until proven to be otherwise. Even after a no decompression dive, your body is off-gassing excess nitrogen. Do not overexert yourself and rest after diving. If decompression illness or barotrauma do occur, you can greatly assist the casualty by administering simple first aid and 100% oxygen. Keep that going until a doctor arrives and takes over. If you see an incident unfolding, immediately contact the Coast Guard on VHF channel 16, the emergency channel. Early warning of an incident enables the emergency services to arrange the appropriate response and assist you in the most efficient manner. When planning to dive in a remote location, use a conservative dive profile. Rescuing divers at sea can be a long and difficult process. Very often, a rescue is not the end, but the beginning of the saga. If decompression illness or barotrauma are suspected, the casualty should be transported directly to the nearest hyperbaric treatment facility. On arrival, a doctor trained in diving medicine will conduct a thorough physical and neurological assessment. 
This assessment helps the doctor in finding the extent of his patient's injuries. It also serves as a baseline against which the patient's response to treatment can be measured. When the assessment is complete, the doctor may seek advice from a medical diving expert who may advise on a therapeutic decompression schedule to be followed. Um, we thought this guy obviously needs to be recompressed. We thought probably a, a table six. I don't know what you, what you think. Uh -huh. Once this has been decided, a medically trained assistant will accompany the patient into the decompression chamber. The treatment of barotrauma and decompression illness requires the patient to be recompressed in a decompression chamber and slowly decompressed. The United States Navy Therapeutic Decompression Table 6 and similar tables have been successfully used to treat thousands of divers throughout the world. This table involves the patient breathing 100% oxygen through a built-in breathing system for several cycles. The patient is then slowly decompressed to the surface in strict accordance with the table. Patients who have been treated should remain in close proximity to the chamber for a minimum of 12 hours in case of a relapse. The treating doctor will advise the patient when sufficient time has elapsed for it to be considered safe to dive again. Diving in Britain's temperate waters normally requires thermal protection in the form of a dive suit, hood, boots and gloves. There are different types of suits. The neoprene wetsuit is close fitting and designed to allow a small amount of water to enter the suit. This water is then warmed by the body. The boots are usually fitted separately on this kind of suit. The membrane dry suit is easier to don, but does not retain heat well and normally needs a thermal undersuit to keep the diver warm. This undersuit has a nylon mesh at the wrist to allow efficient air venting from the dry suit wrist-mounted vent valve. Make sure that the outer material of the undersuit does not block the dry suit vent valves, as this will cause problems with buoyancy control on ascent. Some dry suits have rear entry zips and require a buddy's assistance to open and close the zip. Neoprene dry suits are more difficult to don, but are usually thermally more efficient. This suit has a front entry zip, which can be operated by the wearer. Dry suits require an inflation valve to offset the effects of increasing pressure on buoyancy control and suit squeeze when descending in water. Modern dry suits have deflation valves to vent off the suit during ascent. Efficient venting of the suit during ascent is vital to control buoyancy. Should the vent valves fail to function or not vent the suit quickly enough, Emergency venting by the neck or wrist seals is possible. Good buoyancy control is a vitally important skill that divers must master. Loss of buoyancy control is one of the most dangerous events a diver can encounter. Neutral buoyancy is achieved by adjusting the amount of lead weight worn. This will allow for changes in diving equipment and for the differences in fresh or saltwater dives. The use of a shock line during a dive descent or ascent will aid the diver to judge their speed and direction through the water. It will also help to prevent uncontrolled ascent or descent by allowing the diver to hold on to the rope until they have correctly adjusted for buoyancy.
wind pivots are a good demonstration of the changes in buoyancy achieved by simply breathing in and out. Hovering suspended in the water without finning demonstrates perfect buoyancy control and makes for very enjoyable diving. A head down swimming attitude allows air to migrate into the legs and ankles of the suit and can lead to a very dangerous inverted uncontrolled ascent. Uncontrolled ascent is dangerous in any attitude. It is the source of many serious diving incidents. Such incidents will be avoided with good buoyancy control. Highly trained divers can use this skillful maneuver to prevent inverted ascent. Shoulders to the left, one on the chest, two on the waist, integral weight belt, okay, put the red toggles away to come off. Once kitted up, it is vital that body checks are made before every dive. It is important to familiarise yourself with the type and layout of your body's equipment. The supervisor should record the diver's cylinder pressures and contents and log the time of the divers leaving and returning to the surface. An ideal wreck dive profile would involve diving to the deepest part of the wreck first, then gradually working shallower and naturally decompressing back to the surface. As a diver descends through the water, the increasing pressure forces gas to dissolve into his body tissues. When breathing air or nitrox, the absorbed gas is predominantly nitrogen. This gas has to diffuse out of the body tissues when the pressure decreases during the ascent phase of the dive. Slow pressure reduction allows the gas to diffuse out of the tissues. Rapid pressure reduction can cause bubbles to form in body tissues. Barotrauma and decompression illness can then occur. Even with meticulous dive planning, unexpected equipment failures can cause major problems. I suppose it was about three months ago, um, I was out diving a, a wreck, a, a U-boat called the U-297. Um, she lies about 16 miles to the west of Orkney. Uh, went out there with a party of friends on my own boat. Um, found the wreck, put the shot in. Uh, prepared to hit up, dive the wreck all was well. Um, I was about 15 minutes into the dive and my zip broke and I filled with water which was kind of cold, and I, I can remember saying, oh dear. <laughs> uh, kind of got myself together and I made my way back to the shot line. Um, I ascended the shot line to, I think it was 61 meters, where I'd done my first stop. Um, it was there I knew that I couldn't complete the decompression. Um, I slowly started moving up, doing all my deep stops on the, um, on the gas. Uh, I switched to 40% at around 40 meters something, sorry, 37% at 40 meters, and carried on moving hand over hand slowly. Um, pulled my 80% at something like 15 meters, 20 meters, I'm not sure which. Um, I stopped at six meters and I hung there, um, forever getting colder and shaking. I knew while I was shaking I was all right, it was when I stopped shaking and I knew that wouldn't be long, so I had to bite the bullet and um, abort it all together. I surfaced, um, I saw the boat in the distance and I scooted towards it. I can remember Kevin leaning out the window, giving the thumbs up, he, you okay, you okay? And uh, I, I'd done nothing, I just scooted alongside. Um, they dropped down the ropes, tied on the scooter, they pulled it aboard, um, I climbed back on board the boat, I wasn't a happy chappy. <laughs> uh, I said I was wet. Kevin looked at the back of my suit and said, well, it's no wonder. And uh, the suit was opened right across my back. 
So I de-kitted. Um, I laid down on the floor. Kevin pulled my suit off, as well as emptying about 10 gallons of water. Everyone was asking me if I was okay, but I think I was... I wasn't, I wasn't suffering from decompression sickness at that point, but I was certainly suffering from hypothermia, and I wasn't thinking straight. Uh, I can remember saying to them something like, uh, that was a god-awful dive, jellyfish everywhere, dark, deep, and horrible, have a good one. And I went downstairs, took all my wet stuff off, and jumped in a sleeping bag. Kevin came downstairs asking me if I was OK. Um, I can remember looking up to him saying, yeah, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine and just rolling up in the sleeping bag, shivering. I think it must have been five or so minutes later, I, I screamed out for him. He came rushing downstairs, and I could hardly speak. I got it in the guts. That's what it got me first, straight in the guts. Doubled me up, and I was on the front. I think I lost about an hour, um, after which I started drifting out of consciousness, or sorry, into consciousness. And uh, Sally was sat there holding my hand, and Simon was in front of me, pulling silly faces and going, are you OK? Are you OK? And like this, and putting the gas mask on me and saying, it's OK, it's OK, the helicopter's on its way, the lifeboat's here. And I, I can remember there as well, thinking, you've not called the emergency services. No. I was just embarrassed, you know. Uh, I can remember. Norman Brass coming downstairs, he was the first one to see me from the lifeboat, local guy. Um, I tried to sit up and apologise to him for putting him to so much bother, but as I sat up, I started to throw fits. Um, your body's jerking violently, your head's spinning round, there's vomit flying out of you, incredible pain. Um, I think I passed out for a bit, came to again, and there was a helicopter winchman there this time. Uh, I threw another fit, I think. Yes, I did. Uh, they got me up. I um, had the full staggers. I couldn't stand at all. Um, incredibly drunken state, if you like. Um, walked me into the hold and laid me down and wrapped me up in a, a kind of stretcher type thing and hoisted me out through the, the hatch. I was put onto the lifeboat and then winched off the lifeboat by helicopter. I can remember looking up at the winchman and sort of saying through the mask, I thought these things were supposed to be bloody fast. <laughs> the terrible pain in my back, and I couldn't lay on my back, and I was asking if I could lay on my side. Um, the doctor was putting drips in me at this point. I think I'd lost a third of body fluid by then. Um, we arrived at Aberdeen. I was put into an ambulance, and then from, from the ambulance, I was transported to the unit at the back of the hospital. So we went on the lift up and into the park and then I was blown down, blown down on a Comex 30 and put into saturation for four days. I thought with going under pressure, that would be it, I'd be okay, but no, it got worse. From hypothermic, I went to hypothermic and was overheating, um, still being sick. Um, everything from the chest down isn't working, total renal failure. So you have two pretty young nurses catheterizing you, which is totally mortifying. And to add insult to injury, they roll you over and um, have one for your temperature. Uh, gas, oxygen, after oxygen. But as luck was had, the next morning I was standing up and I was talking to my wife on the mobile phone. That's about the height of it. And how do you feel now? How do I feel now? Um, three months later, um, I've passed my HSC medical, although I'm restricted to 20 meters. I was diving the other day, and I was at 17.3, and all is well. Um, I still have some numbness in these two fingers, especially on the inside, which is the nerve from the top of the back that runs down the arm to there. I still have a slight patch of numbness on this leg and the tips of my toes, and down the side of the foot, there's still some sort of numbness and tingling. But I can, um, I can sense hot, cold, sharp, dull. Do you think that's going to recover? I think slowly but surely, yeah. For the U-297 deep dive, Ian intended to use this dive profile. Due to an equipment malfunction, simply a broken suit zip, 
Ian was unable to complete his planned decompression. This was his actual dive profile. Recent research has shown that all divers will have gas bubbles in their body tissues even after a normal dive. It seems that the body can tolerate a certain amount of gas bubbles. But once this amount is exceeded, decompression illness is the result. The real problem is not so much that the larger bubbles in the tissues and joints cause pain, but rather that the bubbles in the bloodstream can block blood flow and so prevent oxygen from reaching the body tissue. If tissue is deprived of oxygen for long enough, it will die. Dead tissue may lead to permanent damage. Every bone, every muscle, and every nerve needs a constant supply of oxygen. The supply reaches these tissues via the small blood vessels that extend to every part of the body. If a bubble of gas forms in a blood vessel, a cascade of effects is initiated. The body reacts to a gas bubble in roughly the same way as it does to a wound. Fatty deposits accumulate around the bubble and then platelets gather. Inflammation and swelling occur and are followed by blood sludging. These mechanisms make it difficult to reverse the effect of a bubble once it has become established. Moreover, all these effects aggravate the problem and serve to restrict the flow and further deprive the tissue of oxygen. If only one blood vessel is affected, the tissue will get its oxygen from the other blood vessels nearby. However, if several become blocked, the situation becomes serious. Unless therapeutic decompression treatment is swiftly administered, tissue damage will inevitably follow. Where nerves are concerned, the situation is particularly grave. Bubbles may form inside nerve cells, causing more damage and interfering with the transmission of nerve impulses. Within a few minutes of nerve cells being deprived of oxygen, irreversible damage occurs, leading to permanent loss of body function. Any further delay will increase the damage taking place. Once the blood sludging effects have begun, recompression may not bring instant relief. There are several types of barotrauma. Any body cavity that contains gas can be damaged by gas expanding during decompression. If this occurs in the lungs, the result is called pulmonary barotrauma, ruptured lung. If gas is unable to escape normally during decompression, the walls of the alveoli may be ruptured by the expanding gas. Once this happens, Gas can enter directly into the tissues in several ways. It can leak into the lung itself. From there, it can track to accumulate in the tissues under the neck, producing a condition called interstitial emphysema. This is diagnosed by swelling under the neck, accompanied by a feeling of crackling known as crepitus under the skin. If the wall of the alveoli near the surface of the lung is ruptured, gas can pass directly into the chest cavity. This is known as a pneumothorax and leads to partial or complete collapse of the lung. Symptoms include sudden chest pain and shortness of breath. The most serious consequence of a ruptured lung is gas embolism. This occurs when gas passes directly into the bloodstream. The gas bubbles are then carried via the heart to the brain resulting in cerebral gas embolism. Gas embolisms can be rapidly fatal. Symptoms develop immediately on the surface and are often severe. These include visual disturbances, vertigo, convulsions, and frequently loss of consciousness. This is a true medical emergency. Immediate recompression is essential. It is vital that if any unusual feelings or sensations of any kind are experienced after a dive, that they are treated as a decompression illness until proven otherwise.
As soon as a problem occurs, radio the Coast Guard on VHF Channel 16, the emergency channel. This is the Genoline, Genoline, Genoline. Over. Genoline, Pentland Coast Guard, you're loud and clear. How can we help you, over? The Coast Guard, military and all shipping keep a listening watch on VHF Channel 16. Your distress call will be heard. This is Pentland Coast Guard, Roger. Can you give me some details of the dive, please? His maximum depth and the total dive time, if you know it. Yes, Pentland, his maximum depth was 35 metres. And total dive time. VHF Channel 16 can be monitored for bearing and distance. This will assist the Coast Guard in finding you if you are not certain of your exact position. Depending upon the nature of your problem, the Coast Guard will alert the search and rescue helicopter, lifeboat and emergency doctor on call and the decompression facility. Your use of the VHF Channel 16 ensures the emergency services can render you the assistance you need as quickly and efficiently as possible. If you are in a situation where you are near a casualty, what should you do? What first aid measures can you take to assist a casualty exhibiting signs and symptoms of decompression illness or barotrauma? Help! Help! Raise the alarm. Organize help. Hello, can you send somebody down to the water? There's somebody in trouble. I think they probably need some oxygen. Remove the okay. casualty Thanks. from the water. Lay the casualty down flat on their back. Monitor the airway, breathing and circulation. A, B, C. Many casualties will be conscious. Administer 100% oxygen. It's vital to keep this going until skilled medical help is available. Slacken tight wrist or neck seals. Cut them if necessary. Leave the casualty in the suit. Don't waste time trying to remove it. Don't artificially warm the casualty. Artificial warming may dilate the surface blood vessels and worsen the condition. If the casualty is conscious, reassure them and orally administer hydration fluids. Send the dive computer and dive log with the casualty to the hyperbaric treatment center. It will assist the doctor in forming his diagnosis and deciding on subsequent patient treatment. There are several types of decompression chamber in which casualties may be transported or treated. This is a folding, very lightweight, one-person chamber, which can be used for transporting and treating casualties in remote locations. Here, the lightweight chamber is being used to transport a casualty under pressure to a larger two-compartment static chamber. The transport chamber is passed into the main compartment of the static chamber and the inner door closed. The internal pressure of the static chamber is increased to match the internal pressure of the transport chamber. The patient is then removed from the transport chamber and continues the therapeutic decompression in more spacious surroundings and with the assistance of an attendant. The National Hyperbaric Center in Aberdeen is a major hyperbaric facility. It can accommodate many divers and is capable of reaching great depth. As well as therapeutic decompression treatments, 
the facility is used for underwater engineering and aerospace trials. It has an enormous, flexible capacity. Divers operating anywhere can suffer barotrauma or decompression accidents. Anyone who has been subject to increased pressure can be affected. The need for recompression and therapeutic decompression is vital for all divers suffering from decompression illness or barotrauma. Treatment facilities are few in number on shore, so all divers should determine before diving the precise location of the nearest facility. The emergency services will do everything in their power to assist you, but it must be remembered that they may be dealing with prior emergencies, or bad weather may prevent them reaching you. Be prepared. Make your own casualty evacuation plan and be ready to implement it. If diving in a remote location, use a conservative dive profile. Casualties suffering from decompression illness or barotrauma must be conveyed to the nearest decompression facility as soon as possible. If this involves flying, the aircraft must fly at the lowest safe altitude. Remember, that driving home from the dive site can involve high altitude. For example, if diving off Oban in Scotland, you have to drive at an altitude of over 350 meters to get back to the Glasgow area. Even when flying in pressurized passenger aircraft cabins, the reduced ambient pressure experienced at altitude can provoke the formation of bubbles in the bloodstream, which may result in decompression illness. In order to rid the body of residual nitrogen, it is wise to allow a rest period of 24 hours after diving, prior to flying. The unexpected can happen at any time, particularly decompression accidents. Even where no rules have been broken and no mistakes have been made, decompression illness can occur without warning. Anyone who has been under pressure is at risk. I entered the boat and started getting uh, pains in the, the lower stomach area. Um, what initially felt like a gas problem, wind, indigestion, something like that. Uh, nothing serious, just a pain. The other two divers asked if it was okay and I said it was fine. You carry on, have your dive and uh, no problem. Within a few minutes of them leaving the, the surface, the pains started rapidly getting worse and worse and worse. I was trying to vomit, I leaned over the side of the boat to try and relieve the pain, thinking if I, if I was sick, it would possibly help. It didn't help. Uh, I, tried, I tried to move back into the boat, but by that time, I had no feeling. Pins and needles from the shoulder here, right down to the tips of the fingers and both arms, and from there down, no feeling at all. In the end, I was lying in the bottom of the boat in, in agony, for want of a better word. It was extremely painful. My dive started at half past eight in the morning, and I was on back on the boat by five past nine. Uh, I got back to my house at quarter to twelve. It was at that point I thought, well, something is wrong. It was very much a diver denial situation. As I said earlier, I'd done diving in all sorts of conditions, to depths in excess of 50 metres, more than five dives a day. I had done so many things that they say induce bends and can increase the chances of having a bend. I just couldn't possibly have had a bend on this day. It was a square profile textbook dive and even better than textbook because I was surfacing so slowly there had been no effort expended under the water. But there was a niggling thought that there has to be something wrong. So I phoned the Diver Diseases Research, Research Centre. They told me I'd had a type 2 fleeting spinal bend and I needed to contact uh, HMS Portsmouth. I spoke to a doctor there and he confirmed that yes, you've definitely had a bend, you need recompressed straight away. It was at that point that the shock really kicked in. I actually had a card in my pocket that explained fully what should have been done and what treatment I should have been given. But by that time, I really feel I was incapable of making any decisions for myself. Um, I was too far gone into shock, and I, I just wasn't thinking straight. Possibly because of these things, I was left for about three and a half hours without oxygen, waiting on an ambulance. The ambulance arrived and took me up to Aberdeen. I think it was around half past seven at night that I arrived at Aberdeen and I was recompressed straight away. I was taken in and taken down to, I think it was 18 metres on pure oxygen and kept there gradually 
decreasing the pressure for around five and a half hours. David was later diagnosed with a hole in the heart, a PFO. This was surgically corrected. Each year, there are many thousands of working and recreational dives carried out in the United Kingdom territorial waters. The vast majority of these dives are conducted uneventfully and without incident. Diving can be very rewarding and enjoyable, but by its very nature, it does involve risks. Don't become a casualty. Dive safely. Um, I was about 15 minutes into the dive and my zip broke and I filled with water. I just couldn't possibly have had a bend in this day. It was a square profile, textbook dive. I had to bite the bullet and um, abort. It was at that point that the shock really kicked in. As I sat up, I started to throw pits. Um, your body's jerking violently, your head's spinning round, there's vomit flying out of you, incredible pain. Well, by that time, I really feel I was incapable of making any decisions for myself. I thought with uh, going under pressure, that would be it, I'd be okay, but no, it got worse. 